Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Richard Volstek. I'm the uh, president of the American Chamber of Commerce here in Hong Kong. Delighted to welcome you all uh, this early in the night, 2015, to uh, a first class event uh, that we hope you'll uh, enjoy and also come away learning some things as well. Uh, may I open with uh, requesting if you have phones or other devices that beep, burp, or whatever uh, to turn on silent or turn off. Uh, we'll, we will be recording this event, and there will be, uh, as typical in Hong Kong, a lot of people are busy in, on noontime, so uh, for uh, many of our events in 2015, we are beginning to put uh, key programs on the website. So uh, if you have friends that couldn't be here, colleagues that couldn't be here, please ask them to let them know that in a few days it will be available uh, online. Just another service of the American Chamber of Commerce in Hong Kong. Before I introduce our speaker today, let me put the presentation today in a little bit of context from the Chamber's point of view. Uh, we have had for many, many years a, uh, an educational agenda in Hong Kong that frankly in retrospect, was a bit narrow, but very important. Uh, we had many executives moving to Hong Kong who wanted to put their children into international schools, and especially on the primary level, there were shortage of spaces. So we've been advocating for increased school spaces and increased schools, uh, K-12, for a number of years. But also about three years ago, we, we realized that that's kind of an elitist, narrow agenda for a place where businesses are trying to hire smart local people and bring in, not just bring them in from out, outside. And so we've expanded our educational agenda uh, and advocacy activity by forming an, uh, an educational strategic group, about a dozen or so senior executives, mainly with educational but also business uh, background, to look at our agenda. And now we are, we are doing quite a bit, and we'll do even more this year. We are looking at um, K-12 education, again, not just for international schools, but also local schools, encouraging more science and technology, English and Mandarin expertise. We've seen since 1997 a decline uh, in English standards in Hong Kong because of the switch to Cantonese uh, instruction which makes it difficult for some people to get a job with multinationals if they don't handle English well. We're looking at special education needs education across the board for immigrants as well as, and expats as well as locals because there's a shortage of trained people and in institutions to handle kids that have special needs. We're also looking at the university development of business schools in particular. We have many business schools, Georgetown being one of them, looking at China, the China market and the Asia market generally uh, uh, for a place to bring world-class American business education and standards and, and content to a broader audience, including Asia. And that's where, actually, we encourage a lot of that. We meet with many of the business schools coming through, and we're delighted to have Dean David Thomas here today uh, from, George, uh, from Georgetown's uh, uh, University's McDonough School of Business. So well, this what fits in with where this is a, a continuing series. We hope to keep drawing upon real educational expertise for the people passing through as well as locally. I know many of you have read, uh, you're here because you've read the announcement, but let me just summarize a few things about our speaker today before I turn it over to him. Uh, Dean David Thomas uh, joined Georgetown's McDonald, McDonald School of Business as Dean in August 2011. Uh, partnering with the Washington, D.C. community. He is a member of the Federal City Council and has served as co-chair of the District of Columbia Mayor's Economic Development Strategy Initiative. This link between uh, education and public policy and, uh, I might say, interaction with the community sorts of things is something we encourage and try to do ourselves. So it's very good to read this. I'm glad to see it happening with Georgetown. Uh, uh, Dean Thomas has co-authored a couple of books and published more than 60 case studies and articles for leading academic journals and practical practitioner publications. He came to Georgetown following a two-decade career at Harvard Business School, where he was a professor of business administration, 
and directed the school's organizational behavior unit. He also served as a senior associate dean and directory, director of faculty recru recruitment at Harvard and led its business school's required first-year MBA course, Leadership and Organizational Behavior, among other uh, assignments at the university. Prior to joining the faculty at Harvard in 1990, Dean Thomas was an assistant professor of management at the Wharton School of Finance at the University of Pennsylvania. He received a Bachelor of Arts in Administrative Sciences and Master and Doctor of Philosophy degrees in Organizational Behavior from Yale, and holds a Master's of Arts in Organizational Psychology from Columbia. So, you know, I look at this list, Dean Thomas. I mean, you know, Georgetown, fine, Harvard, fine, Wharton School, Yale, Columbia. I'm like, where's the West Coast? <laughs> Maybe a postdoc at Berkeley? I don't know. But uh, <laughs> now, seriously, we are delighted to have an eminent scholar and a real practitioner mixed in one person come to speak to our chamber. And it's with great pleasure that I introduce Dean Thomas, who will talk about the future of business education. Dean Thomas. Um, that was a, a great introduction. Uh, let me start by thanking all of you for coming out and uh, spending some time uh, with myself and my colleagues here. Um, <clears throat> first, let me give you the big picture for, uh, for why uh, I'm in Hong Kong. Uh, I've now been dean at the McDonough School of Business for, uh, four, for four years. Uh, and one of the things that we've become quite focused on there uh, is deepening the global content, global reach, global activity of our business group. And in that effort, we've developed something that we're referring to as a 12 city strategy. Uh, but we've identified um, 12 cities around the world that uh, we think will shape the way in which global business unfolds uh, over the course of the next 50 years or so. And Hong Kong is one of those cities. Um, I just left uh, another city that's uh, uh, part of that suite of 12, Seoul, on my way, on my way here. And there are two other cities in Asia, uh, Singapore and Shanghai, that are part of that group. And my, uh, so as we uh, embarked on this strategy, uh, we also then said, well, you know, uh, we, we have to have a dean who's actually global. So uh, we created something called the business, the business Has No Borders Tour, and that's the tour that I'm on uh, with a few purposes. Um, one is to uh, engage our major stakeholders who are uh, alumni of Georgetown and also parents of Georgetown students. Uh, and then uh, secondly, to connect to our stakeholders who are uh, in business. Uh, as well as other organizations that are interested in creating global leaders. And as part of this, uh, I'm also on a learning tour. So let me tell you what I want to try to do here. Uh, sounds a little off. We're okay. <laughs> We're okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> what I want to do here in the, in the next few minutes is three things. Um, Share a set of observations about business education and its future, uh, in particular taking up the question, what is the future of business education? I want to give you a sense of what we're doing at the McDonough School of Business to respond to that context as we see it. And finally, I want to engage you uh, in dialogue uh, generated by a question and answer period of and part of the purpose of that is to make sure that I learn the kinds of things that are on your minds. Uh, so uh, uh, that will be your gift to me uh, to engage me with the kinds of questions that you think business schools and business school deans should be considering uh, to hear our answers. So let me start with a set of observations about the future of business education. And the bottom line is, um, I think the future of business education is bright if we can get it right. 
which means uh, if we can align with the reality, the current realities of business and society. And um, you know, one um, <clears throat> reason that I was drawn to, to Georgetown is that I think uh, it has all the seeds, if you will, to align with those realities. And part of understanding that reality um, is to you know, look at the, what the pundits say about how the world is evolving. And you have people like Tom Friedman who talks about uh, the world is flat. Uh, others who uh, have characterized the last century, the 20th century, as the American century, and the 21st century as the global century. That's not so much a prediction about American decline as it is a recognition of the reality that what were once called emerging and developing nations have now become undeniably influential players in the shaping of the global economy. So we can't think simply through the lens of uh, American business education or the American economy. Right? We have to think globally. And what that requires <clears throat> is that we uh, develop a global orientation toward business education. And to do that, we have to recognize some of the things that are shaping that global reality. Um, the first is obvious, my guess is, to, uh, to all of you who are in this room. Uh, and that is that markets are being globalized. Markets are globalized. And it's being enabled very quickly by technology and logistics, a reality that means that a one-person company can be global in its reach and touch. Uh, no longer can we think about globalization or global business uh, in the context of multi, you know, what we used to think of as large multinational corporations. Um, we also have to understand uh, that there is a reality to the flatness of the world that uh, Tom Friedman talks about, uh, especially when we think about it from the standpoint that almost any transaction can be facilitated anywhere in the globe. You don't have to be in big financial centers to operate or trade on global markets. The structure of business transitions uh, business transactions is also becoming much more homogeneous, meaning uh, we can essentially do the same things the same way everywhere in the world. Credit card transactions. There are certain things that we can now do anywhere in the world and they look exactly the same. Uh, we also have uh, the reality that this global marketplace uh, increases the contact between people of different cultures and often different cultures that exist within the same organization. In fact, I'm, uh, 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 I've been uh, fond of saying for these last uh, 15 years or so that the most diverse places on the planet are workplaces. It's more diverse than where most people live, certainly more diverse than where most people worship, uh, and even more diverse than where most people shop. And that requires us to develop an education that prepares young business leaders to meet that reality because, in fact, uh, we are shaping the relationships that people export out into the environments where they live and do any number of other transactions in the way that we bring people together in workplaces and around work. Uh, <clears throat> and there's an opportunity in that global reality. As well, um, globalization is no longer just a matter for the C-suite. Uh, there was once a time when uh, the only people who needed to think globally in a company were the C-suite elites. CEOs talking to CEOs. Today, uh, purchasing managers are having to operate globally, uh, up and down, if you will, the, the, the hierarchy of organizations. There's global interaction required. 
that's facilitating or undermining uh, the relationships between people who are different. <clears throat> and one of the things that um, this requires is that uh, we have an understanding about cultural differences and how to build effective relationships across those differences. And it also it requires us to understand that while um, Tom Freeman may be right most of the time, that most of the time the world is flat, it is the managers and executives who are able to see the hills and the valleys that still exist because regional cultures still matter, local cultures matter, language matters. And understanding the ways in which we have to not assume that all of the world is flat in order to create the kinds of interactions and products uh, that are actually needed uh, in the world. And those will be the leaders, in my view, who will head the companies that win and make a difference in the 21st century. And the last thing I think that's part of this global reality that we have to understand is that um, market-based solutions will be important to address the world's most pressing challenges and opportunities. And that means that business education becomes even more relevant, not less relevant to the world. Uh, you know, we can, we can think about um, the last century as one in which in many ways we relied upon governments to solve those big problems. Uh, and if not governments, large NGO type organizations like the World Bank or the United Nations or the International Monetary Fund. And increasingly, I think it's clear that uh, the solutions to the world's biggest problems require people who can work at the intersection of business, public policy, regulation, and that those are the things that global business education has to address. So now let's look at um, global business, global business schools. Uh, it's a booming business. There are over 12,000 schools in the world that provide a business degree of some sort. 1,000 of those uh, are actually accredited. Um, a tremendous number of them are actually located here in Asia. Then the question becomes, how many are actually prepared to meet this reality that calls for global business education? And my observation is that few of us are. Uh, that few have truly begun to align their missions and their curriculums and their activities to meet this reality. So I want to talk a little bit about what we're attempting to do to address this reality uh, at the McDonald School of Business. And we started a few years ago uh, by looking at this reality and then asking and looking at who we are um, and defining two things. Uh, one, our aspiration uh, to be the destination for global business education in the world. And two, to define our mission, which is to educate and develop principal leaders with a global mindset to be in service to business and society. And we think a fundamental element that is needed in the global business environment that we are inheriting is this orientation towards service. So how do we approach this? And in my view, what is, what is, what is required in global business education? How do you know it when you see it? Because there's not a school on the planet today that will say we're not providing it. Well, I think uh, that there are four uh, major ingredients. Uh, and for us, they form a kind of prism through which we look at everything we do. The first element of it has to do with educational content. 
What are we teaching? Is it global? Is it comparative? Does it spark those kinds of considerations in the way that students become engaged with it? The second element is exposure, meaning do we create opportunities for our students to get out there and to see it, to truly understand it as an experience? <clears throat> Third element is what I refer to as encounter. Uh, and that's where it's not simply enough to have our students see it. There's you know, what I kind of call the, the tourist approach. Right? You know? Uh, students can go and say, and I, I remember when I was a, a, a student in high school, uh, there were these different uh, educational programs was back in the early 60s. And um, we would go abroad, and the entire time we were abroad, we'd travel around the country, we'd look at things, and we'd never, so we'd get exposure, but we'd never actually encounter. So we didn't, we were a bunch of American kids on a bus, talking about what we were seeing, seeing the ways in which it might be different. But we really didn't, we never got the opportunity to actually encounter it in a way that we created relationships, personal relationships, with the people in those cultures, with the people who were different from us. And to the extent we might have, we didn't have the opportunity to create high quality dialogue to understand how and when those differences between us and them might actually matter. <clears throat> so <clears throat> the fourth element is this element that has to do with the intersection of business and society and bringing that perspective to bear in looking at global challenges looking at global business opportunities. That it's not simply enough to understand the functional aspects of, of marketing or finance or operations uh, as purely business transactions. We have to be able to see them in the context of how they shape, add value, or detract from value uh, in the communities that surround. And how Different ways in which societies are organized create different kinds of constraints and opportunities for business. Differences in property rights, uh, differences in uh, the assumptions about how market-based uh, businesses will regulate themselves. Uh, there now we know uh, there's now we know more than one model of capitalism. Uh, there's what we can think of as democratic capitalism, where we assume that the breaks that get put on how we engage in markets essentially arise out of some kind of democratic process that we put into legislative roles. Uh, there's also a much more centrally controlled kind of orientation toward capitalism, uh, which is the way that I would characterize much of what's happened in the, over the last 20 years in the context of China. Uh, so there are different models that, that we have to understand. And the differences in those models is about that intersection of business and society. It's also about um, <clears throat> what kind of ethos we're developing in the business leaders for the future. Uh, and this is where we think at the McDonough School of Business are focused on this idea of principal leadership and service becomes critical to creating the kinds of leaders who will use their opportunity in business, their understanding of market-based solutions to actually create value uh, that helps us to address some of those challenges that face society. So some examples of what we've done at the McDonough School of Business <coughs> that speak to this uh, is we revamped our MBA curriculum. Uh, <clears throat> and we began by asking the question, if we really take seriously these themes, business and society, global mindset, principal leadership, what will we do? One of the things that we do <clears throat> in our program is that it starts with a module called the Structure of Global Industries. It's 
very intense three-week module that students are engaged in before they start to engage in the functional courses that define the program that you find everywhere in marketing, finance, et cetera, operations. Um, and in this uh, structure of global industries, they're exposed to the question of what is a global business. They're also challenged because they have to create a global business of their own, uh, and we create a simulation. Uh, also built into this is uh, ethics. And uh, we introduce two kinds of shocks as they go through their simulation. One is economic shocks. The other is uh, ethical shocks. So you can imagine <clears throat> a few years ago when we first launched uh, the program, the big issue was would the U.S. go off the fiscal cliff? Uh, another uh, issue had to do with the manipulation of currencies. Uh, and so they would go to their inbox and one day uh, they get a note that uh, <clears throat> the U.S. has gone off the fiscal cliff. What does that mean for the assumptions they had made about the product they would make, where they would sell it, where they would make it, etc. We also introduce ethical shocks. So imagine they've created a business that's a retail-oriented business. They had to decide where to make it, where to sell it. They decided to make it in what they thought were low-cost labor environments. They come to their inbox, and there's an ethical shock. You are manufacturing your product in a place where there is extensive exploitation of child labor. How does that impact how you move your business forward? <clears throat> We've also, uh, in this effort, begun to look at um, our undergraduate program and made a strong commitment to deepen the global content and exposure of our students. This uh, year, uh, we'll launch a joint program with our School of Foreign Service that we think uh, has the seeds to represent how business education will need to evolve in the future. Uh, that it will be as, and that's, and that's really about creating a program that sits at this intersection of business and society in an even deeper way than anything that we've done to this point. We're also uh, on track uh, to gain the resources to have as a required component of our undergraduate business program a global experience that we think is critical. <laughs> Around the, the question of exposure, all students in our graduate program are required to do something called the Global Business Experience. This is where students are assigned a consulting project, they work in teams, they have to go outside of the U.S. Uh, uh, to deliver their product to their client and engage with their client and really understand in a deeper way uh, what the, some of the dynamics are that surround business in a different context. We bring them back together um, and create something called clusters of knowledge where students who study the same industries but in different countries come together and really try to dig deep and understand what is it that's truly sort of globally transferable about, say, the auto industry. Uh, and what is it, what are the ways in which local culture actually makes a difference in how that business plays in a particular context to develop that ability to see not just that the world is flat, but in that flatness there are hills and valleys, but you need a particular kind of mindset and perspective to identify those hills and valleys and know that they're there. In Encounter, um, we've approached it in, a, in several ways in terms of this idea of building high quality relationships. One is that we've come to recognize that global is not just about out there. Global is also about what is inside. And I talk about something with our students and faculty called we have to be global at home. Uh, Georgetown University uh, is a, a, a special place because of the international diversity that exists within it. So for example, in our um, <clears throat> MBA program, 41% of the students have a passport that is not a US passport. Um, and uh, that means 
We're global at home. Um, we run a program called the Global Executive MBA that has no nationality that is a majority group. When students come together, and they come together on uh, three different continents, five different cities over the course of 18 months. But right there in that classroom, they are global at home. We are focused on shaping that experience so that they learn how to create the kind of dialogue, engagement, respect across differences that allows them to explore uh, those things that may be in the margins, because for the most part, the world is flat. For the most part, a financial transaction is a financial transaction. There's often something in the margins that has to do with the ways in which culture will matter in the execution of that transaction that will determine how much value it can create and will determine the success of the subsequent interactions around those transactions. <clears throat> and likewise, our global business experience where we do take people out to give them exposure is also designed in ways to enhance the quality of encounter that students have as they engage the individuals, the people who live in those other cultures that they are engaging with. <clears throat> and in all of the different aspects of our program, we, 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 we continually look for ways in which uh, we can have our students understand the idea uh, and reality of being in service to business and society through their activities as business, as business leaders. A great example of this is um, we have a, a group in our executive uh, management and leadership program, our executive management and leadership program, has gone to South Africa every year for about, uh, for almost a decade now. Uh, and they've created a project where uh, they were consistently working with villages uh, around the challenges that have to do with clean water. And how do you create a solution around clean water that uh, uh, creates value for a community and that's also connected to opportunities for entrepreneurship. Finally, uh, let me just say a bit about um, the approach that I think uh, business schools need to take that's represented in the choice that we've made. And that is um, not to simply see ourselves as an exporter of our way of doing business, uh, but to also find high quality partners that allow us as an educational institution as well as our students to understand better how other parts of the world think about the same challenges, the same issues that we engage. And we've done that through developing partnerships with what we think of as high quality partners. Um, Asade, which is a university in Spain, has been a partner of ours now for several years in developing our global executive MBA program. We're also, uh, <clears throat> this year, launching a partnership with City University of Hong Kong. Uh, for uh, where we will be sending uh, a number of undergraduate students who will be here for uh, roughly six weeks in an immersion that will also uh, give them uh, a number of opportunities to engage with business leaders here as well as to engage with students here to get to gain their perspective. And uh, my colleague Paul Almeida, who's our senior associate dean for executive education, who's here today, will be going with me tomorrow morning to uh, Xiamen University in China, where we've uh, been engaged in faculty exchanges for quite some time and are now in the <coughs> uh, uh, throes, if you will, of uh, developing and launching an executive MBA program. And there are other schools and universities uh, that we have partnered with, uh, and we continue to look for partners, and we truly mean partners, not simply gateways to students, but partnerships that allow us to learn and expand our knowledge. Now, I've spent um, a good deal of time talking about degree programs, but I also think there's another place where truly global business education matters, 
And that's in the executive education work that companies do to prepare their executives for the realities of global business. Because I think one of my observation is that while business has become global, many of our companies, our workforces, have not, in particular, in mindset. Uh, and in today's environment, because that global perspective is needed deeper in the organization than simply at the C-suite, it creates the challenge and the opportunity to develop the human capital in our organizations to better understand the global realities uh, in which business operates and in which their decisions matter, uh, as well as to understand that intersection of business and society. And that's an area where our activity has been growing. So a great example of this for us has been work we've done with one of the world's largest mining companies that uh, <clears throat> recognized that they had a pipeline of talent that over the course of the next decade will move into important positions as country managers uh, and essentially what they are until that moment is geological engineers and suddenly they're running a country operation where they have to understand that intersection of business and society. They're also likely to take those roles in multiple different countries over the course of their careers and they realized that they needed to prepare those people before they got there. And one question I think that all of our companies need to be asking is, how prepared is our workforce for the global reality that we are operating in that will only become more and more real and intense and ultimately will be where the opportunities are uh, to operate uh, and to win in the marketplace when we'll have to be global. So let me just uh, end uh, <clears throat> with a bit of an analogy. Uh, there are 12,000 business schools. One way to think about this world that we sit in is uh, it's, a, it's, it's like a crowded high school dance. <laughs> it's, like a, it's like a crowded high school dance. Um, you've got a bunch of teenagers on steroids. That's what the business schools are. We're all looking for students. We're looking for opportunities. Uh, we're looking, you know, we're looking for partners. And if you're one of those people who's being asked to partner, you have to be careful because we'll all tell you that we're doing the same dance that you're doing. Uh, only for you to find out that uh, we were doing a waltz and you wanted to do the samba. Uh, and what that, what, um, what that means, you know, is so or put another way, is that I think it's very important for the, the, for the, for the business community uh, as well as even you know, those of you who are parents who might be sending a young person off somewhere to get a business education to think about what is the dance? What is the dance that I want to do around preparing either my workforce, myself, or even the most precious thing in my life, my kids, to operate in this global world and then to look at those institutions not simply by reputation but to think about the educational content, the opportunities for exposure, how explicitly do those schools build, the build in the opportunity for high quality encounter so that it's not simply global tourism, global business tourism, but actually learning how to build those high quality relationships. And finally, what is the emphasis on operating at the intersection of business and society with the idea that leaders in business have an obligation to serve both business and society? So I'll stop there. Uh, and uh, open it up for, uh, for questions or, or for comments. Thank you. Our first rate. All right, let's have some questions. Uh, please wait for the microphone because we are recording this. Thank you.
Uh, thank you. Um, your speech is full of um, noble ideas and noble intentions. And one area I'm curious about is while we're preparing young men and women to become global principal leaders, who's teaching the professors? How do you source the, the faculty that is going to not only embrace um, this type of, of thinking, but actually are, are almost expert-like in being able to, to train and educate our, our young people? It's a great question. Um, you know, it, it, I, I think we have a particular advantage around this at Georgetown. Um, in part because we are, uh, we are a Jesuit university. So we have a heritage that has a normative set of values that start with the idea of service. If you, if you walked around Georgetown, you'd hear this phrase, men and women for others. Uh, it also um, has an ethos that comes from the evolution of the Jesuit tradition about going out into the world and meeting it where it is, and then understanding how one contributes to make a positive difference, which is also why uh, the, the uh, uh, Jesuit universities uh, constitute the largest, the, the, the most global network of universities in the world because of, that, because of that tradition. That allows us then to set before our faculty not a debate about is service important, but the question is how will we manifest it as a business school? Um, I think the other, uh, 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 another approach that I take as dean and I try to interview every candidate uh, who comes through for a job, is I try to understand what's motivating their work. And one of the things that uh, often comes through is that uh, some, some individual's work is simply motivated by trying to find the next incremental advance on the last study. But other people's work, even though it may look like that person's work is seeking that inc incremental advance, when I get in conversations with them, it turns out they're motivated by a problem that they saw in the world. Uh, so their work is simply a window onto the world, and as they evolve or develop as scholars, if we create the opportunities for them to take on these big important questions, that's the direction that they'll move in, in which case the kind of thing that I'm talking about as an educational practice becomes much easier. Uh, for a faculty member to accept and see the value in, and rather than it being a diversion from becoming a famous scholar, it's, you know, it's, it, it, it's actually part of what they think makes them better as a scholar, better as an educator, better as a teacher. Uh, but it has to be a deliberate process, uh, and I think the other uh, piece of it is we have to talk about it all the time. Uh, and, and that's what uh, we've attempted to do and why I think we've we've gotten the kind of engagement that we have uh, from our faculty in doing that and why I think it differentiates us uh, in the experience that people have when they come through uh, at both the graduate and undergraduate levels. Uh, and we even hear it from our recruiters of our students that they see that there's something about the way that process of formation has influenced our students uh, It just makes them in some ways uh, just as aggressive, just as an ambitious, but a bit more humble, a bit more likely to ask the service question uh, to engage those opportunities. Uh, and likewise, uh, if you look at the portfolio of our faculty, I think what you would find is we have a disproportionate percentage of our faculty whose work is at that intersection of business and society, who are looking at the policy implications of their work as well as the economic business implications of their work. Thank you. Um, Peter Liu here. Uh, I'm the chair of the Human Capital Committee of MCHAM. Professionally, I'm a headhunter specializing in the higher education sector. Now, to build on that question, uh, I'll share an interesting uh, phenomenon, and maybe you can share some of your experience uh, with us. Um, when we talk about global, uh, the four steps you mentioned, uh, one of the things is global faculty. Uh, 
you, you asked about. Uh, because a global faculty uh, to many of my academic friends is not necessarily determined by the ethnicity uh, of, uh, of the professors. It's actually where they have spent most of their professional career. For example, many of my candidates in Hong Kong, when I call them up there for local opportunities within, including City U, who is my client, they always say, Pete, how come I always get a call from you about opportunities in Hong Kong and in Asia? I never get a call from a U.S. headhunter <coughs> offering me a position, a senior position in the States uh, because they have probably got a Ph.D. in the States, worked for a few years as an assistant professor, and eventually come back to Hong Kong to take up senior positions like department heads or even deans. Uh, but they would like to go back to the States with the right opportunity to take a more senior positions. How do you see U.S. business school uh, uh, embrace the concept of truly global faculty? Thank you. It's yeah, a great question. Um, I think uh, uh, a couple of things uh, there. Um, one is, I think, increasingly... Um, there is a convergence of standards in academia globally, and that should increase that flow. Uh, the other that, that place where we've tried to uh, address some of that is through these partnerships that create faculty exchanges and faculty interactions. Um, I hope and I think that you're I think that you're absolutely right that for business education to evolve to be truly global, uh, we will need to see more of that kind of flow of faculty members uh, uh, for between the US and, and 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 international and not only at the most junior levels. Because I think what you will find uh, if you look at a lot of faculties Ours is one. Um, our faculty who have extensive experience outside the U.S. often have it by virtue of having grown up outside the U.S. and then come to the U.S. to complete their PhDs, uh, but their interests are framed in a way that they're asking, they, they, they've been asking questions almost from the onset of their doctoral education that makes them relevant to where they came from as well as relevant to the disciplinary concerns that they're being educated in. And now the question becomes how do we you know, increase that? I think another uh, 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 activity or, or, or answer in this question is uh, allowing our faculty opportunities when they have sabbaticals to take them outside the U.S. So an example of that is one of our senior, most senior faculty members um, is a, a, a faculty member named Rena Agarwal. Uh, she's taken her sabbatical this semester as an advisor to the Central Bank of India. Um, and we've had other faculty members who've taken their sabbaticals outside of the U.S. Uh, and we think that that's also part of our faculty becoming more globally engaged and globally informed. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. My name is Grace Nyang. I'm from the HKUST Business School. And out of the 12,000 business schools you just mentioned, we are one of those uh, very international uh, business school in Asia. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we, we do have a lot of, uh, we have done a lot of what you have mentioned regarding how to enhance the exposure in culture in, in session with the business community. And uh, my observation and my question is regarding actually now we did see a trend that a lot of Asian students would love to go global, go to US or rural or other Asian countries to do the business education. And not just for education, but also for work. Yep. And, but then I, we also observe there is a, uh, a trend that in the U.S. actually less students would like to leave the United States and actually go to study other 
in, in Asia or to work in this place. So in your business school, do you do? You, and of course, we value the trend that people are really thinking globally, behaving globally. But how about in reality to go globally? Yeah. So do we have any motivation to really motivate students to have yeah. this kind of experience? So, so um, I think that there, 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 there are within school variations, among school variations. So I think that um, Georgetown may be an outlier in this because uh, one of the things that we um, began three years ago, which is the only one of its kind, is a global career conference. And what motivated us to do that is that there was a high percentage of our students, both US students as well as our international students, who want opportunities outside of the US. Uh, and so, so we may be different the other is, and this is why we've, we've put an emphasis on uh, the global exposure that we give our undergraduate students, is um, so that they understand that opportunities in the world lie far beyond the borders of the US as well as within it. And if they don't have those considerations early, the US is still, uh, you know, the largest consumer economy by dollars in the world. Um, uh, and there's lots of opportunity there. So how do we get our students to understand how you know, having global experiences actually will make them more valuable uh, as, the, as the world evolves? Uh, so I hope, and I, I think just how the world's going, uh, that, that we will see more U.S. individuals early in their career looking for global opportunities. And the good news, although, you know, it's a, a, a small, is if I compare my students that I have today at Georgetown with the students that I had almost 30 years ago when I started my teaching career uh, at the Wharton School, there's a, there's, there, there has been a shift in that, in, the, in that mindset and understanding, although not as great as uh, 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 I, would, I would like to see. But, I, but I, I, I feel like the trend is right now. I'll admit it may be that you know, I'm dean of an outlier school because, as I said in my observation, there are 12,000 schools, but I don't think that most of us have started to do the kind of realignment to truly create a global experience. Um, and uh, I will recognize that your institution is uh, one of the few that I think is, is in the vanguard for doing that. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Uh, my name is Susan Collins, and I'm a GU undergrad um, and a lawyer professionally. Um, and you had asked us what we're thinking about these days. What's, and, you know, I've lived in Hong Kong for 20 years, and I've been here for 20 years. And, and um, an issue that's been on my mind a lot, I think mean, for the past 10 years, I've been helping to run a foundation for an individual charitable foundation. And, and what I've seen changing in, our, in this industry is the, the need for NGOs to become much more professional. And um, it was interesting you know, coming today because a lot of what you said resonated with me because we, yes, you know, it's a job that I've been doing professionally, but I think as business leaders, we all need to turn our minds to what we're doing for our society. And I just wondered what Georgetown is doing um, in order to educate the leaders of these NGOs. Um, and because, I, because they're becoming more professional or need to be professional, how can we learn? So uh, a couple of things. Um, One, we're, we're, we're actually uh, beginning this year a program that is led uh, by our uh, Global Social Enterprise Initiative uh, that's focused around leaders of non-for-profit organizations uh, to help them think about how you create sustainable business models that aren't 
totally dependent upon the third party foundation kind of funding, right? That you have to, 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 to do that work, you have to have some concept of how is it do, I, do you create a market around what you do? Uh, uh, so you create a viable and sustainable business model. Uh, we also, uh, in, in looking at students that we admit to our program, our primary criteria is, is this an individual who can use what we give them to provide leadership in the future in whatever they do? So we actually have a significant portion of our students who actually go off and do something that wouldn't, at least in the narrow definition, uh, be coded as uh, going to work for a business, as in a traditional not-for-profit business. <clears throat> Lots of them going to social enterprises that may be for-profit or not-for-profit, uh, as well as um, training uh, a significant number of our students uh, actually come from the governmental sector, but again, see those business skills and acumen as important to do the work that they need to do. We've also uh, created something called um, the Executive Management and Leadership Program for principals in schools in the Washington, D.C. area uh, as part of the effort to help to transform how school systems are managed, and in particular one of the largest in the country, the Washington, D.C. school system, because a lot of, the, of what we teach in business that's about managing systems, taking a systems perspective on things, uh, is important to scaling innovation, uh, and particularly in the context of, uh, uh, of schools. Uh, and you know, in that sense, um, I think in lots of ways, uh, this is also the business education center, because so much of what I think we have to offer is elevated broadly to what needs to happen uh, uh, to, uh, to transform uh, and to address many of the problems and challenges and opportunities that are at that intersection of business and society. So, so we're on that. <laughs> As, uh, as my son would say, Dad, you're on that. <laughs> uh, two more questions. Here. Hi, Dean Thomas. I'm Robert Yu from GMAC, the owner of MBA.com and GMAC exam. Yeah. I have a question regarding your program offerings. As I noticed that Georgetown has launched Master Finance, yes. online. Which, is, yep. which is an online program. Yep. And is that a sign of, obviously, it's maybe it might be a test from your side, but do you see an online offering for special, specialized programs, either at the master level or like what HBS, Harvard Business School, has been doing in the past year to non-business undergrads and even high school students outside business essential? Do you see that something that Georgetown is interested in pursuing, uh, given your global ambition? Yeah. Thank you. Um, so, so I think that we are interested in um, finding other opportunities beyond our Masters of Science and Finance program online uh, to make our content more broadly available, in particular in areas where we think we have uh, uh, significant depth. So finance was one of those. Uh, just as a bragging right, uh, Business Week uh, declared our undergraduate program number one in finance last uh, uh, in their la in their last ranking. Right? So we're so so that's an area. We have a few other areas that we think are like that. Um, I don't know, uh, and uh, I know the the Harvard example well, uh, having spent 21 years on the faculty there uh, and was there when, when those discussions were getting started that, that led to what they're doing. Um, I don't know that that's a direction that we're likely to go in, but one thing I will say about online education in the context of global business education is that if there may be a threat to creating truly global business education, it actually may be online. Because the approach that often guides online thinking is an approach that says, because we want scale and volume, we have to teach to a kind of homogenization 
that doesn't allow us to take into consideration the ways in which cultural variance may matter. So a choice that we made in our Masters of Science and Finance program that actually is a very expensive choice is that um, we're actually a blended model. Probably 80 to 80 percent online. There's about 20 percent that's residential. And part of that resi one of those residential activities is that even our Masters of Science and Finance students have to have a what we call a global business experience. So they also do a consulting project that requires them to go outside of the U.S. to engage with, with, with people in another context. And you can imagine, we could easily teach that in the way that most people think. Finance is finance all over the world. Why do you, why do you need a global component? Right? But we think that's important to shaping the way uh, they will engage their roles as, as finance executives. And one of the things that I think we've got to engage around what does global business education mean in this technologically enabled context. That's uh, uh, a question over here. Thanks, Arthur. Felix Lee from the Heinrich Foundation. My question is more um, on, uh, on the soft skills um, that you are helping your um, students to develop. So um, just a generalization, I think, um, from the employing, or from an employer's perspective, in experience I've come across, um, a lot of graduates are still over-expecting and under-delivering when they come out uh, and get a job. Now, it's not necessarily that their hard skills are not there, they most of the time they are, uh, but it's the maybe insufficient soft skills that is helping them deliver what they need to in a team environment or in a global environment. So I appreciate the fact that you've got exposures and encounters that is helping to develop a global mindset. My question is, what sort of infrastructure or facilitation do you have in place to help students develop the, the corresponding soft skills that go with the global mindset? Yeah. The cultural awareness, the cultural sensitivity, yeah. you're sending teams abroad to do consulting projects. You know, who's going to be coaching them, mentoring them, helping them to go through conflicts and uh, realize what they need to learn from their experiential learning? Yeah. So we have uh, uh, elements of those things built into our curriculum. Uh, both in the context of courses, but also one of the things that we've found uh, and that we've heard from employers uh, that they see in, our, in our, uh, our students is their ability to work in teams. Because a lot of the way we've designed our program, both at the undergraduate level and the, uh, and the graduate level, uh, requires a, a significant amount of, of, of teamwork. Uh, and we build in experiences for individuals to get feedback from their team members about how they're being experienced. Uh, at the undergraduate uh, program level, uh, we also really encourage our students to take on leadership roles and opportunities where they can experience themselves trying to shape and move uh, groups uh, and to learn from those experiences. Uh, for our Graduate programs, uh, in particular our executive programs, um, we have career coaches. And one of the things that, the, that our career coaches do uh, is an assessment of students. And oftentimes what emerges is that where a student needs to do work, be more conscious, is on the soft skill side so that they get feedback and then suggestions for how they can get those things addressed through the curriculum or other ways. Last thing I'll say to this point is that um, as we were uh, evaluating and redesigning our MBA curriculum, um, we realized that um, we needed to put in more opportunity uh, explicitly for students to understand what we refer to as social intelligence. So we created a course called Leadership and Social Intelligence which draws on some of the basic things we know about leadership and leadership behavior and interpersonal and group dynamics, but also now brings into it some of the understanding that we know exists uh, from the neurosciences. 
that leads to things like uh, misperception, uh, um, you know, the, the, the inability to see through another person's perspective. Uh, right, so we're trying to build that understanding of social intelligence as an important part of what's required to be an effective leader. Uh, so, final question. I think we're, I think we're doing we're probably doing okay. Would you please? I think we've talked everybody out. No, no, we're going to leave some time. I have some closing comments, but also we had leave time uh, between now and two. So if you want to come talk one on one with Dean Thomas, you have the opportunity to do so. But first. Let me uh, allow me to give you a Foreign Corrupt Practices Act safe gift Thank you. on behalf of the chamber. <laughs> uh, again, I want to thank Dean Thomas for uh, fitting in perfectly in the kinds of things the chamber is trying to do. Uh, I do think it's incumbent upon the chamber to say a couple of things and in, in, uh, in comment to your opening question about what are we seeing on the ground uh, from business in a place like Hong Kong where most of our members have really regional and global responsibility and not just country management sorts of activities. One thing we're seeing is that uh, cross-border finance, as you mentioned, is in fact a rapidly evolving field in many respects, uh, including e-commerce and e-payments, Bitcoin, other kinds of currencies, other ways of dealing with things, it has become much more complicated in a very rapid short time. So that the challenges of getting uh, the financial dimension correct uh, and staying ahead of the curve is increasingly challenging for existing executives, let alone people coming out of their business schools. Uh, related to that is what I hear on a regular basis from senior managers is that no one has enough accounting. Everybody hates it, but it's uh, be able to read spreadsheets across cultures and uh, of course, it's a constructive exercise reading uh, multiple uh, spreadsheets from family businesses in Asia. Uh, and so that uh, that is also a, a, a kind of intellectual awareness, but also a, a skill set that is you know needs to be uh, better uh, trained. Another area that is extraordinary is uh, supply chain management, supply chain issues across the board. Again, a lot of American students are used to the American market, uh, dealing in multiple currencies, not just multiple currencies, but multiple cultural environments in which the attitudes towards labor, uh, towards even labor law or strikes, or what constitutes a fair minimum wage, uh, these are quite a bit of variance. And so at that level of labor, there's a, a major issue in supply chain, but it's much more than that. Uh, we see that in uh, the whole umbrella of sustainability, a factory that's doing things for a brand, any place in the world has to look at labor issues, looks at structural engineering and safety, look at water use and recycling, at green power source, at uh, uh, community involvement in one form or another. All of these are part of a package. There's a HIG index, H-I-G-G, HIG index that is being developed that brings the sustainable component parts for factory certification together. But what it really does is show the increasing complexity of integration of different fields. Whether it be finance, labor, uh, CSR, uh, engineering, what have you, into one component uh, evaluation process. That is new and is complex, but it's absolutely necessary in the future. A third thing that also came up today is that the we have run for two years packed rooms talking about uh, social media and the impact on B2B, B2Cs, you name it, uh, business. And again, the social media impact on every aspect, whether it's internal communication in the company or external with customers or other business partners, is just an exploding field. It's hard to stay ahead of it. And so smart businesses hire people in their early 20s, as we have done to teach from the bottom up on how to handle some of these things and uh, try to stay ahead of it. Uh, what's interesting about that is that the global mindset is now facilitated by international, global, uh, international uh, connectivity through social media. And so it's, a, it's, an, act, it's, an, it's a resource that, uh, that especially international students from K-12 in Asia 
or anywhere, as well as adults, well, now it's commonplace to be on Facebook, say, with people from 12 countries in the course of a day or two. Certainly my kids are that way. And so it's, uh, uh, but how do, you, how, do you how do you translate that connectivity into developing a, a qualitatively superior and broad mindset that allows a real sensitive intercultural interactivity? Uh, we don't see the Congress being a good model of that, by the way, but we do see educators moving that direction. Uh, leadership was also brought up. Uh, absolutely, we have a lot of leadership things going on in our continuing programs here. But again, the leadership also involves increasingly followership. It's hard to be a good leader if you don't want to be a good follower, and that's what embodied in the team training. And so learning to be part of a component group where in one aspect you're a leader and another aspect you're a follower simultaneously is really an a increasingly common thing. In, in global businesses in particular. Very exciting, but also, how do you teach it? Uh, a final thing that I would say is that uh, your own experience is absolutely relevant in the sense that uh, we see drivers of international trade, international change, a sensitivity about cross-border activities being driven more by cities and states than they are by the federal government. They're just more flexible, they can react faster, so places like Boston or Chicago or Los Angeles or, or Seattle or whatever have much their mayors and the, some of the governors are much more Akamai, much more sharp on what needs to be done to encourage cross-border business, not just with Canada and Mexico, but Asia uh, in particular. So it's a very exciting sort of thing. The other thing we see related to that is, uh, you might say, very, very on campus. Uh, it's my opportunity to talk to a lot of business schools for various reasons, no, no, not all of them legitimate, but, the, uh, but the, the thing I find is that the first thing I said we've got 41% or 38% or whatever percent of our students are international. And the second thing is that we have team projects that are also cross-national teams. But then you ask the, uh, the administrators and say, okay, let's walk to the cafeteria. The Chinese are there, the, European, the French are there, the Americans are there. They're not interacting socially. So the challenge for a business school, an undergraduate and graduate business school specifically, is how do you facilitate, stimulate social interaction, even when you got them in your hands, of a, of a, of a more comprehensive sort. And that has been a real, real challenge. Uh, one of the solutions that some schools are looking at is when they accept students, they accept students who have already lived overseas because they are the catalyst. If they're Chinese and they've been in the States or Canada or Auckland or someplace uh, for a year or two, a junior year abroad or something, then you're putting them in there and they, they get the Chinese students to break, help them break the ice with other people. But it's a big challenge because we find a lot of that. We talk with Chinese students going to business school. They should have just stayed in Beijing. They went to eight together, went to class together, went to the library together, went to the same, the same dormitory or apartment, didn't talk to anybody unless they had to. And so that's not unique, I think, to one, just the Chinese. So uh, all the things I've talked about, by the way, for those of you who are members of the chamber, know that we're covering these things on a regular basis, continuing education, as it were, in our events here in the chamber through our uh, financial services committee, uh, communications and marketing, human capital, uh, apparel footwear supply chain, and uh, ICT committee, and so forth. So it's an ongoing thing, not only in events like this, but on member-only invitation smaller group activities as well. So those are the gray name cards are not getting the full benefit of chamber activities until you join, right? But I hope this is a, these, these topics are things you talked about, but I, if nothing else, to reinforce that, you're, that Georgetown is doing the right thing from our perspective, from my perspective at least, but it's a real challenge to stay ahead of when we see in Asia, you know, the, the extraordinary speed of change, especially in the e-commerce, e-anything uh, area, social media area. I go back to the States, Midwest, obviously from my accent, uh, and it's like, you know, the trees are bigger, but the, uh, the, the, the global mindset is, if anything, narrower. And that worries me because until we get a, a critical mass of people, not just at Hong Kong, you're self-selected here because they're global people, they wouldn't be hired. But throughout the United States, 
in the world, really, when they go back to their local communities, they see that those communities need to be connected globally. Because 95% of American customers are outside the United States, potential customers. We've got to figure that out and work on it. And I'm glad to see that Georgetown is at the forefront of that. We really thank you. When you come back with students or yourself or other faculty, do let us know, and we will squeeze your brain some more. That's the best and champ way. Again, thank you all for coming. Hope to see you again in future events of this sort and related activities. Thanks so much.